All right, so in this video, we're going to look at implicit differentiation, um, which you can think of as an application of the chain rule in several variables. Um, we, we did an example like this in class, and we did not do one like this, so we'll do, uh, we'll do one of each so you can see both of them and, and see how these things work. Um, so implicit differentiation is an application of the chain rule, just as it is in, in one variable. Um, but as an application of the multivariable chain rule, it's, it's actually fairly subtle, um, and you sometimes try not to think too hard about it. Um, but let me, let me walk you through this so we can see how it works. So in the first example, well, the first thing we might want to do is say, OK, I want to, I want to change this equals into a, into a minus. So bring that over. Set the whole thing equal to 0. Okay? And, and so we want to do that because then We have a function of x and y over here. Okay, um, so basically, what you're what you're going to do here is is you're going to think of it this way. You're going to think of essentially defining, you know, so you want to say that this f of x y defines, let's say, y equals g of x, right, implicitly. This is, this is sort of the assumption that you make in Calc 1, right, is that an equation like this implicitly defines y as a function of x, which is why you can go ahead and try to look for dy dx, right? And, and we know how to do this using Calc 1 methods, right, where, okay, if you take the derivative of y cubed, you should have a 3y squared times y prime, right? Anytime you take the derivative of something with a y, um, you should get a dy dx um, out of the one variable chain rule. Uh, but the way, the way you want to think about this here is that you're, you're sort of doing this. You're sort of defining, and let's give it a new name, let's say h of x, right, as something that depends only on x. So h of x is like f of x g of x, okay? And saying that, that g of x defines, you know, saying that g of x comes from this equation, that, that this comes from defining y in terms of x via this equation, what that amounts to saying is that putting y equal to g of x should solve this equation. So h of x should be identically zero, right? Um, in particular, it's a constant. So I know that, uh, I know that h prime of x has to be 0. On the other hand, I know that uh, using, the, using the multivariable chain rule, I know that this should be, so the derivative of f with respect to x of xy times, if you like, um, dx dx, right? We're using x as sort of our, our variable here. And, and then we have the y derivative times dy dx, right? Um, dy dx being essentially g prime. Um, <coughs> and I mentioned that there, there, is a, there is a subtle thing here, which is that in this, so let me, let me just kind of point this out. I think it's, you should think about this, but not too hard. Um, in this, in this dx, 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 um, this is x as a, as a coordinate in R2, as one of the two coordinates you're using in R2. Um, this x is actually in R. Um, so there are different x's, right? But you still get to say that dx dx is 1, I mean, which it seems like it obviously should be, right? And, and the reason you can do this is that you're using, you're using a parameterization where we're saying that uh, x, y as a point in R2 is given by x and g of x, right? Um, 
So this, this again, this is the R2x over here. This is the Rx over there. Um, if, if this really throws you off, if, if you find that this makes your brain hurt, one of the things you can always do is you could use T for the R coordinate, and then this becomes T G of T, and then it would still be the case that dx dt equals 1 because you're defining x equals t, okay? Um, but normally we kind of allow this abusive notation because, you know, it just it's simpler to write things down. And so you can now solve for dy dx, right? So dy dx, you move this over to the other side of the equals sign, divide by the y derivative. Okay, and then it's just a matter of computing those partial derivatives and plugging it in. So we come back up to the original function, x derivative, we have a minus, or sorry, the minus sign is out front, that minus sign. And then we have 2x minus 16xy to the 4, okay. And on the bottom, y derivative, 3y squared minus 32x squared y cubed, okay? And you're done. Uh, the condition under which this is valid is that this derivative here has to be non-zero, okay? The y derivative has to be non-zero. Um, and one of the ways you can kind of think about this, if you think about level curves for a function like this, do you think what's going on with the level curves? Um, the, the points at which the, the x derivative is, is zero, these are sort of stationary points um, with respect to x. So these are points where, you know, if you move x a little bit, not much happens. Um, those are essentially your horizontal tangents. Um, and, uh, you know, the places where the y derivative are zero, uh, these, these correspond more or less to vertical tangents. And you can, you can kind of play around and make sense of these things. But, um, it gives you at least a simple way of, of seeing how to make this work, right? Um, and now, if you're using this as a theoretical result, and we're going to point to it over here, um, what this does, what implicit differentiation does with the, the implicit function theorem, which kind of gives you the framework under which this is valid, the reason that this is useful is that it tells you that once you understand graphs, you can, you can pretty much understand everything because really what this is saying is that as long as you stay away from the points where this y derivative is zero, um, whatever curve is defined by this equation locally, so not, not over the entire curve, so not globally, but locally, um, any piece of this curve can be expressed as a graph, right? So results about, say, tangent lines and, and you know, curvature, if you're thinking about second derivative, all, all these results that you develop in Calculus 1 um, for, for graphs that look like this, um, they're valid for curves that are defined this way, um, sort of locally, as long as you stick to kind of a piece of your curve that is between two vertical tangents, essentially. Um, you, can, you can think of it as a graph, and you can use results that are valid for graphs. Uh, coming over to here, it's sort of a similar story. Uh, so this, you know, this is now some function of three variables, right? So f of x, y, z um, equals 4. This is a level surface, right? Um, and, and we've seen among the quadric surfaces, we've seen some level surfaces like the ellipsoid, like the hyperboloids, right? Some of the, some of the surfaces that we've seen are, are defined using equations like this. Again, um, as you're sort of developing things, as you want to understand things, one of the um, philosophies you can take is to make sure you understand graphs really well. So make sure you understood that, you know, if you could write, so the idea here is you want to think of this equation as implicitly defining z as a function of x and y in the same way that over here you think of this as implicitly defining y as a function of x. Uh, it's the same idea. So locally, you want to think of this as a graph, right? So and if you think about you know, like an ellipsoid over a sphere, right? Um, if you take the top half or the bottom half, you can think of it as a graph, um, right? Uh, you just can't think of the entire thing as a graph, only parts of it. Um, so 
That's useful because if you understand things like tangent planes in the context of graphs, now you understand them for level surfaces. And we'll, we'll talk about that in the next video. But for now, let's just do the derivative. So how do you, how do, you do the implicit differentiation here? Um, well, what we're going to do is, is we're going to say, so suppose z is, is the g of x, y. So kind of what we're doing is we're saying, OK, so it's going to satisfy this equation. So that means that if we did f of x, y and g of x, y, that should be constant. It should be 4, right? And, and then you sort of take the derivative of both sides. So we'll do, let's, let's say we do d dx of both sides of this equation, right? So d dx, right? Um, and, and you want to think about what you're really doing here is, is you're, again, you're doing like a parameterization. You're, you're saying that, uh, that x y, z, so think of it as a parametric curve, uh, but more like a parametric surface, right? Because um, you're using now x and y as parameters, right? So this is sort of now like the second case of chain rule where you have, you've got three variables here that each depend on two of the variables. Um, and once again, um, we could if we want to worry about this, but we don't have to, you could use u and v over here if you like, because um, the x and y on this side, um, these are, are x, y, and r2. These are, of course, in r3. So once again, they're technically not the same x and y, but uh, we're not going to let that stop us from getting the answer. We can still go ahead and work through this. So if we take the derivative with respect to x on both sides, you're going to get, well, you're going to get the x derivative with respect to, and we'll just write z, dx, dx, and then the y derivative, dy, dx, okay, and then the z derivative. And that's going to be equal to zero because the other side is the derivative of a constant. Um, here's the part that drives people, you know, um, well, kind of is, I don't, I don't want to say it necessarily drives you crazy, but it can be very confusing. Um, this will be one, okay? It's the derivative of x with respect to itself. Um, dy, dx, well, these are partial derivatives, right? So when you take the derivative of y with respect to x as a partial, uh, you should get zero. And now you come over here and you say, well, hey, shouldn't the, the same logic should say that, that this should be zero, right? Because x and z, they're independent variables. Um, well, no, because you define z as, you know, we're saying that z is being defined implicitly as a function of x and y, right? Um, here, this, this x and y, um, you know, you kind of think of it over here. Um, y is being defined as y. And again, this is where maybe you want to think of this as like, you know, u, v, g of u, v, if, if, if this confuses you. Um, and then this would be like uh, d, d, u going across, right? And then you'd say, well, well y is equal to v, so d, y, d, u is, is zero because it you know, doesn't depend on, on u. Um, so, so this is a one, that's a zero, and then this is the thing we want. So then you can solve for it. You can say, okay, so, so d, z, um, d, x is going to be minus f of x, y, z over f sub z of x, y, z, right? And then, you, and then you actually come back up to here and you say, so what are those derivatives? And you plug them in. And so we say, okay, x derivative, uh, 4x cubed y cubed z minus 2xz cubed. Uh, and then... Um, uh, y, z, cos, x, y, z, all over. And now we do the z derivative. So uh, x to the 4, y cubed, uh, 3x squared, z squared, and then x, y, cos, x, y, z. And you've got it, okay? Um, I'll leave it as an exercise for you to do the y derivative. Um, for the y derivative, it's going to be the same sort of story. Um, 
these on the bottom, the dx's on the bottom become dy's, and then this derivative will be 0, this derivative will be 1, and this will be dz dy. So dz dy is going to be the same thing, except this is now going to be the partial with respect to y. So in fact, the only thing that changes is this numerator. You replace that with the y derivative, um, and then you'll have dz dy. Okay, uh, so we'll leave it at that. Next video, we're going to talk about tangent planes for level surfaces.